Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, and of course, happy Halloween. I'm Jason Leddington, SOMA board member and associate professor of philosophy at Bucknell University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh Science of Magic Association seminar. Our topic, uh, quite appropriate to the holiday, is magic and emotion. And we're fortunate to have three remarkable guests with us. Christine Moore is a full professor at the Institute of Psychology at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Her research interests focus on two major domains, psychological correlates of human belief formation and color psychology with fo particular focus on affective processing. And we'll hear more about her fascinating magic specific research later on. Alongside Christine, we have two of today's very best magic performers who are also without question among the most thoughtful, penetrating and clear headed thinkers about magic today or any day for that matter. The indomitable Jamie Ian Swiss and the incomparable Teller. Thank you very much to the three of you for joining us today. We're all very much looking forward um, to hearing what you have to share. So here's how we're going to run things. In a bit of a departure from previous seminars, we're going to skip the individual introductions and lightning presentations and jump straight into conversation. As moderator, my approach will be pretty hands off. I'm looking for free flowing conversation, but enough with the chit chat, let's get into it. Magic and emotion. And I wanna start with the side of performance and performance design. So Jamie, in your essay, Good Trick, Bad Trick, you write of emotional hooks. Can you say a bit about what they are and their importance in the design and development of a piece of magic? Thanks, Jason. Um, I, I'm compelled to uh, begin with a, with a bit of a caveat. The, this essay, which appeared in my first book, Shattering Illusions in 2002, actually first appeared in Genie Magazine circa 1993. And um, it's quite prescriptive and uh, sort of mechanistic. And whenever you do that as an approach to art, you are in danger. <laughs> um, that said, the work, this was, this was something I didn't create for readers and others initially, I created it for myself. So really what I was doing was I was sharing a tool that I developed for myself in my early days of thinking about repertoire and thinking about adding routines, tricks to my own personal repertoire and how to best think about that. And the basic premise of this essay is, you know, there's good tricks and there's bad tricks and we're probably better off if we start with good tricks. <laughs> uh, and so I spent some time defining what I mean by that. What's a good trick? What's a bad trick? Because that's a even that is a debatable premise in the literature of magic. There are some who say there's no such thing as a bad trick. There's only bad performances. Uh, my friend Mike Gallo says there's no such thing as a commercial trick, only commercial presentations. I, 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 I tend to agree a little more with that. Um, but Tommy Wonder once said to me over dinner, what's all this talk about commercial, commercial this, commercial that? First, just make it good. That was an exact <laughs> quote. And I, I, I agree with that. So the point is, is as, I, as I conclude in this essay, uh, which provides uh, five characteristics or categories, uh, characteristics, I guess, of good tricks, um, I concluded in this essay that this is just about potential. All these things mean uh, they're, they're potential elements that come with a trick that give you an advantage to build on. And the more of them you've got, you have sort of a running chance, a running start, let's put it that way, at getting to something that's worth doing. But in the end, that all has to do with execution and personal vision and so on. So of these five categories, the first two, and I was talking here about close-up magic, so that particularly affects the first category. The first two categories were audience involvement and emotional hooks. And I point out very quickly that actually audience involvement is just another, is a subset of emotional hooks. I separated them for pragmatic purposes because for a close-up magician, if you borrow something from someone, if you just have someone take a card, they are directly involved 
And that immediately gives them some kind of emotional connection. And the reason you want to think about these things, that we want to think about these things as magicians, is because all too often, especially for magicians starting out, when we're fascinated with tricks, uh, we end up presenting puzzles. We end up presenting things where the only thing, the only way for the audience to relate is to try and figure it out. And beginning magicians often have this problem of being challenged by audiences. And what they don't realize is they're not giving the audience anything else to attach themselves to. And if the audience has some emotional connection, then they're less inclined to, to just be thinking about how it is. But in fact, they have something to feel. Eugene Berger used to talk, he had a phrase, he said, you know, too often magicians do tricks that are simply um, adventures of the props in the magician's hand. And uh, magicians kind of love that kind of magic when we start out. Um, but this idea of emotional hooks is just a sort of a simplified form and there's a long history. There are many plots in magic. For example, magician makes good, magician fails, magician succeeds. The moment a magician fails, makes a mistake, that's an automatic emotional kind of hook because that's not what's supposed to happen. And people have an immediate emotional response to that, whether they feel bad for the magician and they want the magician to succeed, whether they're glad that they're, that they're, that you, you see the magician struggling, but they have an emotional response. Um, and themes of gambling and con games, the three card Monty, challenge themes, can you do this before I do this? Can you do this faster than me? All these kinds of things are very simple, emotional ideas that engage an audience above and beyond just watching something or trying to figure something out. And, you know, if you borrow an ancient plot, you know, if you borrow an object from an audience, a, a watch, uh, was very typical in the 19th century, a bill, uh, and you, you know, crush their watch or you tear up their $100 bill, they have an emotional response. It's unarguable. <laughs> and that's a good place to start. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Tella, can you tell us a little bit about your approach to this as a, not only as a stage magician primarily, but also um, just the, the role of something like emotional hooks in your creative process? Um, my, my, my job as both a sort of creator and a director is to provide the it is to put myself in the place of the audience member and ask myself what I would love to see and what I would love to feel. Now, there really isn't any form of entertainment that I watch, that, that I watch or participate in, that doesn't have some emotional quality to it. I mean, Hitchcock used to call and say that the, the movie screen is a rectangle charged with emotion. And if, if, if from the moment something begins, you're not engaged emotionally. It's no good as entertainment, whether it's magic or anything else. And magic has this very strong intellectual component that, as Jamie said, sometimes becomes the dominant fascination for uh, an inexperienced performer, where all they really will be talking about is the, all they really will be addressing is the, the question of um, what seems to be going on versus what is really going on. Now, let me tell you, that is actually an emotional hook in itself. It's almost impossible to watch magic in, a, in an emotionally passive state. Um, it, it really is because you're seeing something that seems to be one way and you know it's another way and there's automatically a, a quality of tension there. Now that tension can be pleasurable uh, or that tension can be just irritating. And that's, you know, the, the art of it is figuring out something that will work there. The, the danger of thinking about emotion, as J Jamie said it perfectly when he said, you know, you don't want to think mechanistically about this. Um, the, the, the danger when you say, I must have emotion in this, is that you, you might take a dumb card trick and attach to it a long sentimental story about your own life and think that you are providing emotion for that. That, that's, that, that can be very, well, it can be boring, you know, because uh, you, you want the audience to be experiencing a story that's full of emotion. Uh, and it's full of intellectual elements too. Um, 
I heartily agree with that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it, we, we, it's prone to self indulgence, is what it is. It 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 is prone to self indulgence. It's prone to, you know, we all we all loved Eugene, but there were lots of times when I couldn't quite take him seriously because his the stories that he would be telling with great emotion were stories that seemed to me um, needed maybe just a little bit more sense of irony about them, you know. To, to yeah, to... I'll just I'll just insert there quickly, and this is perhaps a little inside baseball, but I think that Eugene's legacy has been misinterpreted by some of his most vocal yeah. interpreters yeah. because the fact of the matter was is that Eugene was a worker, yeah, and really he actually used story narrative very very rarely in his work, very rarely. And also, Eugene was such a character. You know, you, you could, uh, Eugene was one of those guys, you know, this, he's this adorable, sort of uh, uh, bearded, uh, fruity, uh, uh, you know, just happy guy, uh, very engaging, very theatrical, very, you know, very, very big. Yes. And you had to love him for that. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't do that. You know, right. I, I, very few people in the world could do that absolutely. because there, there was always that sense of playfulness about it. Exactly. There, there always was. And he, and and uh, again, he he didn't he didn't really believe in overdoing stories at all. And I think you're absolutely right that people people have taken that to you know sort of off off the deep end. There's another another thing that I. I kind of conscientiously, I, I don't like thinking mechanistically. However, there are certain things I do think mechanistically about. And one of those is, <clears throat> uh, you know, a Aristotle judged the, Aristotle judged the, the success of a, of a plot to a great degree by how many reverses there are in it, how many times everything turns upside down. So, you know, Oedipus is the big, Oedipus is the big boss guy and he's going to find the murderer, but he keeps finding evidence that he's the murderer and doesn't quite know it yet. So there's this suspense that just kills you through the whole show. I think that surprise is a tremendously underused device in magic. Magic is intrinsically capable of really surprising you, really deeply surprising you. And very often magicians will really come out and they'll say, OK, pick a card and I'm going to find it. You know, or or or, or do the, the equivalent, and that gives you. If you walked into any movie, and the you know, and it said in a title card at the beginning of the movie, here's what's going to happen in this movie. Your your desire to watch would go way way down. So one of the most I find one of the most engaging things is to constantly be raising in the in, in the audience's mind, and I'm identifying with the audience, raising in the audience's mind, what's going to happen next? Where is this going to go? I, you know, and just just keep me on the edge of my seat, going, oh, oh, you know, not telling people things that they don't want to know, or that they don't that they shouldn't know, or telling them things that are wrong that are going to turn. So your example, Jamie, of the uh, the, the 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 plot in which the magician fails um, is a perfect example there, because as far as the audience is concerned, the magician is a character who is intending to succeed, and now oh, there's a reverse. And uh, that's also one of the hardest things for magicians to act. It's one of the hardest things for yes, anybody. it is. The, you know, you often see you often see that done in a way that's so artificial that you just go, "Come on, give me a break. I'm smart." I, I work on this with cli with clients all the time because uh, what magicians who are generally not trained actors, what they tend to do in these situations is they d deal with it emotively. You know, oh my, oh dear, something terrible has happened. <laughs> and they speak it instead of acting it, reacting emotionally. You know, the best response I ever saw to the uh, Terry Subrick burn bill where the magician discovers a mistake has been made and the actual bill was accidentally burned was by a wonderful magician from Cleveland named Howard Flint, who when he saw the guy take the paper out of the envelope instead of the bill, and then looked into the ashes and realized the bill had been burned. He paused, and then he began to laugh uproariously. Mm. And that's a real-world response. That's something that real people do when terrible things happen: is they laugh nervously. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's a that's a very uh, difficult difficult thing. And I've always, but I've always felt in this what, what what you raise here. I'd love to hear you talk more about this because I, I talk to people about it all the time. 
um, talked to a student about it just the other day, that I always see in your work the use of conflict, which of course we understand is an ele- a, a fundamental element of drama, the use of conflict that you find all sorts of strategies. You also have the advantage of having that noisy partner, um, but also that you use accidents, really convincing accidents. And I think you've done that a lot in your work over the years. Uh, here or there, yes, yes, we we have. I, I when, when you were talking about reactions, one of my one of my favorite things to do when uh, when something is supposed to be a mistake, is just stop. You know, I just uh, uh, there, there are moments if it's gone wrong, what do I do? Okay, you know, I mean, it, it just yes. you, you, you know, it just let the, let them do all the work. Yep. Uh, it, it's it's remarkable how when you just shut up for a moment and don't do anything, the audience will fill in that gap. The audience will do the thinking for you. Right. You know, you you really don't have to go. Oh my goodness! You know, you go. Exactly. Hmm. And you hear the audience going, "Oh, we get it now." And they, you know, there's a there's a there's a nice response to that. Right. Yeah, we have uh, on. Uh, I'm I'm trying to think of specific. Well, examples. the most dramatic example I would I would cite would be by Buddha. The duck is immortal. Oh yeah, that was a that was quite a long time ago. The one that I was thinking of was our sawing. Uh, oh yes, we, you know, yeah. We, there you go. We, we do a, we do a sawing the woman in half, sawing the I guess you know nowadays one would say sawing the person in half, but there are advantages to the the, the person being as someone who identifies as a woman um, and who in fact is a woman because their physical help, helpfulness in, in it in that we have a, a large circular saw and the Georgie Bernastic um, the woman who works in our show um, reclines in a very thin looking box uh, on a table and we, we saw the, we saw the box in half and we're very happy about it. And then we explain that, well, actually, it's the, the trick is, the, we're going to show you how this trick is done. It's, uh, it's very, very clever. You should see it. And we take the front off the table underneath the box. And now what you see is that there are two, two boxes, and drooping down in the table is Georgie's midriff. And um, uh, we say so. You see, the saw just never comes anywhere, anywhere near her. And we have these, we have these emergency pegs to keep the saw from going down there. And uh, we we pull out the pegs and show them. And at that moment, the saw is running, and the saw runs completely through her body. The table splits apart. Blood, blood and guts, guts gush out everywhere. And everyone has a mighty laugh, um, be, because it's just you know it's so <laughs> it's so over the top. But th- that's that is an example. Another good example, I think, is one of the early things that we did, our hand stab. Uh, I was thinking of hand stab also. Yeah, yes, this a is a perfect that, example. That, 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 was, that was one of our absolute standbys for years in which Penn was simply being annoying. And the idea was we were going to have a card selected. I would be blindfolded. The cards would be spread out on a block. And then I would stab, stab the card with a knife. And Penn did everything possible to irritate me. And you could see the irritation building in me through, throughout this until finally, I, you know, I call him over. And you hear me with my back turned, whisper, you know, cut it out. <laughs> and then uh, we, we go back to it again. And Penn persists. And in the course of it, he's, he does one more gesture to spread the cards a little more in an irritating way. And I bring the, the, the knife down. And it goes right through his hand. And he raises it. And he screams and screams and screams. And then we immediately break it. That's one of the nice things about that trick is that the moment that you've got the, we've got the full surprise and break, the moment you've been convinced that the that this really was a terrible accident, we throw it away. We throw it away because we don't we don't want to insist once the audience. Yeah, because he it. goes from screaming and blood spurting to, and is that your card? Yeah. Yes. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. So can I? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. Please. I want to. I want to steer us back a little bit to the question of what's distinctive about magic, with respect to emotional responses, and um, uh, many of the things you guys are describing uh, are things you find in all kinds of theatrical presentations. But there is that one element that you referred to, Teller, the 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 the, the experience of the divergence of what seems to be the case from what you know is really the case. And that as an emotional hook itself, as you put it. Um, And so I'm curious how that fits in with the other stuff that that you guys are are talking about. Um, And 
why you think magic has, thanks to that particular type of emotional hook, um, a distinctive sort of power and attraction. I mean, uh, 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 if you want to start, Jamie, or shall I start? Either way, go ahead, Tom. Um, you see, one of the reasons that you see a lot of not very good magic is because magic has intrinsically this extreme power. It is, it is just about the strongest theatrical form you can have. I mean, I, I can't think of a theatrical form that speaks more immediately to more people because it's, it is on the subject of what is reality. And that's the most basic question anyone has to answer before they, before they go on with any decision in life. So very early on in, in your childhood, I don't know the exact year, but there's a point in your childhood when you learn that what, you, what seems to be going on might not really be what's going on. Uh, that you can lie about something and that that is usually bad. But if you put that lie in a frame, it, it becomes okay. Um, and that's a very, that, that's just a very fundamental grab for people because a magician can come out and just wave a handkerchief and pull out a dove. And because the dove wasn't there before, they will have an emotional reaction to the surprise of that event simply because it's, they've, they've seen something that they know can't be happening. So there's that tension. There are, I, you know, I, I contend that the, there, I think there are many people in, in, who, who talk about magic who say, well, we should aspire to have audiences never try to be figuring out how the trick is done. I give up. I mean, you, you can't, nobody really can do that. They can pretend. Magic never washes over you like a Tchaikovsky symphony, you know, t t taking you along. Magic always has that intellectual component. And it also always has the component of evil, right? Because lying is evil. It's lying is evil and you're watching it and something that if it were delivered in a different context would be a bad deed. I would be trying to sell you, you know, a house that's going to fall down. But in this one context, magic is this sort of playground where this very important thing that we have to do all the time, we can now get it wrong and it's fun. So does that really tell or not? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that the, the idea of the playground there, the idea that 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 magic must intrinsically in order to be experienced as positively be experienced as playful do you think that that makes sense is that something is that true yes that we, yeah yeah it's, it, it has to have an element of play in it i mean when you go to a, to a horror movie you're going for play you know that the stuff that you're seeing on screen is not real and you just you want to play with those emotions and celebrate the fact that the, the horror is happening on the screen and not in your real life but I also think it's best when it's a serious kind of play. Yeah. When, when you're really forcing the audience to take things seriously. Darren used to say about Eugene that Eugene did magic that was serious, but not somber. Mm -hmm. And I really learned, despite Eugene's playfulness, I really learned something from him way back when about taking the work seriously. Eugene said, if you, if you, want, if you want the audience to take what you're doing seriously, you have to take it seriously yourself. And so, yes, it is playful. Um, and, you know, I think I, uh, one of the reasons that uh, scientists uh, and engineers really enjoy magic is because it's sort of a, they see it as a burlesque of their work. They're confident in their knowledge of the universe. They're not threatened by it. Mm -hmm. and, they, and, it's, and therefore they delight that everything they know is turned upside down for a few moments. Uh, one of my favorite definitions of magic is was written by Whit Hayden, who I consider was not only a wonderful performer, but a great theorist, underappreciated theorist. And he talks about how uh, that in the best magic, and I agree with him here, you're trying to hoist the spectator on a knife's edge. And on one side, it can't be magic because there's no such thing. Spectator knows that. And the other side, it must be magic because there's no other explanation. Most magic is done in a way that allows the audience to comfortably step down on one side or the other. Usually on the, it's not magic. And magicians are always running from magic with comedy and making fun of what they're doing. Uh, because as Max Maven says, mag magicians are afraid of magic. Um, I, I, guess, I guess I'd like to come slowly in. I feel there are so many different topics that actually allure to 
the research that we are doing and you will see the echo of it. And actually, Jamie, I will read your paper because um, you said a couple of things to which I will come back because first of all, I think you make a distinction what I heard so far between the emotion of the actor, the artist and the emotion in the audience. And when we started to work with magic, what we actually wanted to investigate is also, Jamie, what you allured to in the end, and that is that the magician somehow tries to pull away from the magic itself because it should remain a comedy or something that the audience knows to distinguish what is true and what is not true. Because you have this uh, separation between reality and the impossible in the reality that you bring into reality because people see it right in front of their eyes. And when we started to do research uh, with magic, the question was, can you convince people that what they see is true? And we started to work by paranormal beliefs. And with my colleague Gustav Kuhn, who is also a psychologist and vision scientist and attention and so on, we started to um, design these performances and added more and more paranormal psychic elements. And the question was, what does it need that people are believing what they see? And the thing is, they believe it so easily. It's actually horrifying, um, talking about horror movies as well. And um, the performance was perceived so strongly emotional. We had tears, we had anger, we had uh, relief, we had um, happiness that you can take, for instance, contact with the dead people. It was uh, cold reading and, and um, the magician pretended to be a medium. And um, it was so shocking for us that we started to look at the actual emotions because they were so right in the audience. Imagine a classroom, three, 400 people. They see such a performance in front on stage and they see it with their own eyes. And they just at 60 to 80% or was a psychic demonstration. Now, if you take this, uh, then there is clearly, and I think there is the danger also what you said, Jamie, about trying to separate, you know, reality and magician and hey, we perform, it's an illusion. What we observe seems that whatever you present at the beginning and you have a very engaging emotional experience, if positive or negative, it will be totally erased. So as a magician, I, we feel from what we saw, you can tell them whatever, if it has something emotionally, personally touching, not a card or a coin, but something that has these potentially truth element or could be possibly, or you know, the knife goes through the hand. And then, yeah, it, it, it is very different for people to distinguish or remember what they have heard at the beginning. Now talking, and that's the last point I, I add right now at this point is, that we had, um, we asked people afterwards, what is your opinion and your feelings about what you just saw? So imagine again, it's a medium taking contact with a confederate and so on, and it's on stage and she's all very, very emotional and glad and sad because it's her dad who died and so on. And so we had, uh, if, if we say all the responses and then we categorize them, you know, were they more talking about positive feelings or negative feelings or, what type of emotions were they reporting? And we had four clusters, and I think that will be quite interesting to you. It is positive. I'm really relieved that this is possible. I'm so glad that I potentially also could take contact with somebody. Or it was negative. This is really horrifying. And you know, this really makes me anxious and so on. And then there was intense people just said, wow, this was strong as a performance. And then, and this is the most interesting one why I jumped in because you started to talk about horror movies, what we called mixed emotions. People were on the one hand drawn to it and not, they were feeling positive and negative. So they could really not decide what, how they felt about it, what they thought about it. And that was, in a second study, we asked people about these emotions and the more they were unsure how to feel about it, the more likely they were to interpret what they, they've just seen in paranormal terms. 
So somehow what you just said at the very beginning, it means or it seems that when you have an emotional component, then it seems whatever the technical question or how was that done seems to be less of an important issue because they feel and so they go with the feeling. So very much what both of you have said before and, and we just see it in experiments really, really strongly. Do you have a, do you have a moral judgment on this? That's a very interesting question because we had, I presented these uh, studies on signs of magic uh, talks and realizing how important it is for our, for the artist, for the magician to give these messages at the beginning, I, what you will see is just an illusion, don't worry about it. Um, it, it it's, I don't have a moral judgment about it. I rather try to understand what happens and what, what Gustav and I started to do now is to debunk people, to see how much information about what has actually been done do you need to tell people that they accept it was actually just uh, a magic performance. And it's true, we had these questions before, you know, what does that mean for magicians and, and, uh, and their art? Because not telling people how it's been done is part of the deal, right? And the whole question also that lying is acceptable in this context, because given the performance that you often do, it is so, like you said, with the splash and the blood and the hand, and do you mean this card, you know, you just try to take again, the probably the, the chumpiness of the situation or the anxiety inducing moment out of it by, by, by having a laugh about it later on. And I guess that's, that's actually, I assume very important. I've read several of the papers that you're referring to, uh, which I find very interesting. And this this broad this this broadens the subject, you know, to the point that we're almost in another topic in a way, uh, which is a fine thing. But I think that Teller and I, up until now in today's conversation, have been talking in very strict sort of conjuring terms, uh, where magic is presented as magic, and the audience is not confused. The moment you shift to mentalism or even beyond like talking to the dead psychic phenomena that now everything changes. Uh, I've wrestled with these issues, not just uh, intellectually mm. in, my, in my writing, but in actual work, because I've done straight mentalism and I have struggled with, you know, there are no clear lines, this whole issue of mentalists are very quick to say, oh, disclaimers have no impact. Well, their definition of disclaimers, however, is incredibly mm. narrow and artificial because most mentalists who make that argument say, oh yeah, I'm just telling you there's no ghosts under the bed. Or, you know, <laughs> and, and that's because their conception of a disclaimer is limited by their own often very limited imagination. Um, I, tr I have struggled to make a disclaimer and I hate to even use the term, an integral part of my mentalism show that's one of the most entertaining and provocative speeches in the show. It's the purpose of the show. I like art that's provocative. And what I find interesting and sometimes distressing myself about mentalism is I'm trying to challenge believers by creating a convincing, a very convincing illusion and then telling them it's a lie. And I'm also trying to challenge skeptics by by creating such a convincing illusion that they are forced to consider the fact that they actually couldn't tell the, the difference unless I was explaining it to them. It's a dangerous and difficult area. Um, and you can't control the whole audience. The, my, model, without, my model of thinking about this is that morally speaking, it is a bell curve. And what mentalists do to defend sometimes the, the ones who are working in a spongy moral area is they say, well, they always say, well, there's always people, no matter what you say, they're going to believe anyway. That's true. I stipulate. That's mm -hmm. the ends of the bell curve. There's some people going to believe no matter what. There's some people going to disbelieve no matter what. I can't do anything about that. I accept it. But what I'm interested in is that huge, messy hump in the middle of the, the bell curve of people who come to a magic show and use it to learn something about how the universe works. That's unfortunate. They're choosing bad sources, but it's a fact that I can't deny. And I think what I say and how I say it and how many times I say it, by the way, uh, has 
something to do with that. That's a model I argued strongly to Darren Brown many years ago, and he has adopted that bell curve model. He talks about it in interviews all the time. It, he doesn't talk about me, but he, you know, but he uses it as a way of thinking about it. And, you know, Darren has always, in his series, used this, this little opening disclaimer. I use uh, magic, showmanship, psychology, blah, blah, blah. Well, it goes by so fast, it's erased. It's, it, there's no doubt that it's erased. But as soon as you move to, the, to the, move the context to the kinds of things you're using in those experiments, yeah, all this idea, when we talk about emotion, we're really talking about a different thing now. And, and you know, I was talking when, when you came in about if you can, in conjuring, if you can hang the spectator in this place where they, they're not comfortable, it creates this dissonance, what Whit Hayden calls a burr under the saddle of the mind. I love that phrase. And if you're good enough at it, you're committed enough to it as a conjurer, the spectator will keep coming back to that and that problem keeps worrying them. And that dissonance to me is the thing that makes magic unique and, the, and wondrous and, and universal. I think that the, uh, the obligation of, of, a, of a magician includes having the audience leave the theater with no false information. He can, they can be left with puzzles and mysteries and questions, but you, they need to be left with no false information. So I, I, the fact that Jamie doesn't just do that swift disclaimer at the beginning and then let it flow from there and let people think what they're, what they're going to think by the end, but that he, that he intersperses that stuff seems, um, seems very important to me. It seems like almost, it's, it's something that I would like to see as, as you know, done habitually by by, by people who do mentalism. Because it, I, I've had some, uh, early on Penn and I did some home seances for people. And at the beginning we told them it was all going to be fake. And at the end we told them that it was, that it was fake. But still, we didn't do this during the middle. And it, so people would say, well, we know the part where the glass exploded on the table must have been a trick. But when you knew what was on that piece of paper that was still in my hand, uh, that had to be something else. And we'd, we'd say, no, it was a trick. It was just a really good trick. Uh, we want some credit for that. And it's always struck me that the mentalist who is able to come out, someday there will be a mentalist who will come out. And this mentalist will say, I am about to do a bunch of tricks with information for you. I have ways of getting information you may or may not know, but I think you will not be able to figure out how this information is getting to me. I, I, there, are, there's, there are no psychic forces at play. I'm not, I'm not looking at your behavioral tics, but boy, I can get information in very interesting ways. Suddenly, that, that elevates the performance in a way that the, the, the typical mentalist doesn't do. It's rather like, like Houdini you know, testifying before Congress and when they say, so none of the stuff that you do is supernatural, right, Mr. Houdini? He says, no. Uh, everything I do is, is, is a trick, but I do tricks that nobody can find out, you know, it, which is such, that's such a beautiful way to, to say, I want credit for my art. I don't want your misinformation to be hiding my art for me. I, Jamie, there's a, I forget who it, who it was that had another, there's a, you know, Whit Hayden's description of the burr. There's somebody, you may remember this, somebody, somebody says, said, said to us, um, Magic is giving you the gift of a stone in your shoe. Oh, nice! I, I don't know that. I don't know that, but yes, that's very that's very nice. Uh, you know, something you just said, Teller. I wish I had this handy. I could actually hold it up to the camera. But um, you said this uh, phrase that you just used to me over a lunch uh, thirty years ago or something, and um, I have a set of business cards. When I do any kind of billet type of mentalism. Mm -hmm. On the back of the card, in very in small print at the bottom, it says, "I have ways of getting information you can't even imagine." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was I eventually came to this idea not that long ago, just a couple of years ago, of putting that right on those cards as as my best hope in close up of having some kind of clear disclaimer and yeah. answer to the question. It's it's even more distressing disturbing in close-up than it is on stage at stage at least i can frame it yeah yeah you know when, when, when you leave the, just 
when you leave that horror movie, you know it wasn't real. Right. I mean, and, and yet there may be somebody who goes to that horror movie and remembers it and says, oh, so I guess ghosts really exist. But I do believe that when, when the film stops running and it says the end on it and it lists the names of the cast and all of the people who were involved in it, I believe you've done your level best to convince people that this is not a reality. Now, we've had, you know, in the last, I don't know, 10 or 12 years or more, we've had this weird shift on television to what they call reality shows. And this is a terrible, terrible, terrible development. Because by calling it a reality show, I believe that people think that they are watching something as, um, as documentary as the news. Yep, um, yep. They believe and, America's Got Talent is a contest. And that's a, that's, that's, that, you know, that I think is part of what has sufficiently undermined the attitude of Americans towards information that they that we know that we've had all of the recent political stuff where people simply lie and 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 that and that and, and get away with it. It's it's very it's very disturbing. I mean, we we are in perhaps the most important profession for the most important entertainment profession for saying to people what you see and what you hear can be false. And you should right. enjoy the fact that it's false, and you know, but you should not take anything for granted. That doesn't mean that you say fake news about everything. It means that you you learn what sources are reliable and what sources are not reliable. Uh, Christine, I actually, yeah, Christine, people. could I ask you a question? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in reading some of your work, uh, you in some of these uh, of, some of these experiments, you were mm -hmm. using. A, an effect where a candle lights in a kind of what magicians would call a living and dead test. And my question in that, you, you, you said a little while ago that you've moved towards more and more sort of spiritual or psychic effects. And I think you have to do that if you're gonna test what you are trying to test. But yeah. to me, when I first read some of that, I thought, well, even the fact that this is such a physical effect that in itself undermines is going to undermine any any kind of belief for not for everyone but certainly for a significant part of the audience if i was trying to get people to believe i was psychic i would not have a candle spontaneous lighting spontaneously lighting do you do you, do you follow what i'm what i'm asking yeah I, I, I totally because it's true that uh with gustav at the time when when we played around and i mean the details of, of how the performance was put together was very much determined by, by him because he's a magician and I'm not, so I'm following the, the device. But the experience we had was, I actually feel that we had one performance in Lausanne that was so well filmed. It was so amazingly well staged that, and also the Confederate was an absolute brilliant actor. It was so emotional that, people were just completely drawn into it. And right, but that's another issue. You, if you're using Confederates, that's another question I had. You're not doing magic at all. Yeah, I, I don't you're, go you're in, doing into, theater. into- You're doing theater. Yeah, yeah. You're doing theater. You're, you're having people watch. It's not magic. It's, it, it could be many things, but it's no longer magic if you're acting out. The, the, the I, I know that's an interior big debate <laughs> of the magicians, but I guess exactly our goal was not that. It was to create something that people, uh, that we wanted to have a nice distribution of some people saying definitely never ever possible and the others say yes, potentially possible. But we had hoped very much in the middle that people were right in their, in their ability or in their willingness mm -hmm to um, accept what they see as, as being real. And the, the, if it's the candle, when we had other props also in, 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 in other uh, performances, I think what for, was for us shocking, really unexpectedly shocking, how high the willingness was, because one thinks that if there are tools or tricks or a die or a coin in it, that it, it so strongly triggers the classical magical of magic performance of the magician um, doing a performance to make you wonder to experience something beautiful and makes you curious about it or surprised you know all these emotions but that 
people are so willing to accept what they saw was just absolutely unexpected and we had to face it because such studies have a couple have been done at some point in the 40s or in the 50s that mess mess Matthew know Matt knows more about it but we, we had to digest it and then treat this information and treat it also what Teller said in in a time right now where fake news misinformation is a big theme in the topic uh, in 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 the current debate and I completely agree here also with Teller that magicians should use their art to make people really aware of it and use it as an absolutely perfect example of telling people, look, what you see looks like reality, but it's not because we manipulate your perception and your attention and your memory and so on. But this is who will look at it, who will look at it, it's again people who are likely want to see it. And probably adding, adding that quickly, um, is, is for us when we told people at the end why we do these studies, because some people got amused. Very interesting to you tell them how it's been done. Some really crack laughing. They think this was hilarious. Others are really upset and others are confused. But if you explain them why we do it in a time where misinformation and fake news is such a big issue and telling them, look how easy it was that you believed it. It kind of is a really nice example that they reflect on themselves. And, and therefore, I think really magicians have uh, the, the tools and the art in their hands to, to make an important contribution in that sense. So this is super interesting. And um, we're unfortunately, we're, we're getting on toward the end of our time. We're going to turn to some Q&A. We've already run on a little bit longer. But I want to push back against following up on what Christine is saying and some of the ideas that come out of her research against maybe Jamie's characterization of, 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 of what you guys were doing earlier on in the conversation, speaking in strict conjuring terms, that idea as though we can talk about the emotional responses and spectator responses that are appropriate to a strict conjuring context. And we can draw a hard and fast line between that and what Christine is finding in the types of contexts that she's describing in her research. And it seems to me that some of the things that Christine was saying suggests that it's maybe harder to draw and establish that line, even in the case of what appear to be normal magic performances, a card trick, um, then, um, and not just in the case of what are psychic or, or mentalist effects. And, I guess one way of posing this question is to, is to ask whether the emotions that magic brings up and that are distinctive kind of to magic and not just the, the, the divergence between reality and um, appearance side of things. But many people have wanted to say that one of the things that magic does is engage us somehow in thinking about or relating to ideas of the supernatural, the counter-causal, the, 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 that kind of idea, the idea of real magic. Do you think that plays a role in emotional responses to magic or in mature spectators? Or is that only in contexts where people are uncertain what's going on? What do you think? What do you guys think? Jamie, you can... Well, I just, I, I, you know, I referred again to this dissonance that the best of magic creates and that Teller was saying, and I agree, is, in, is you, you can't escape that there's an emotional response just to that, to seeing the impossible, knowing it is impossible, seeing the convincing uh, demonstration of the impossible while you absolutely have the awareness it's impossible. And when you talk about, and that hard line, I think, does reasonably exist psychics don't pa you know float a woman pass a hoop over her and say that's my that's my psychic power come follow me that doesn't happen it's too much right um but that moment of passing a hoop for an audience that's not confused about what's going on is the best of magic is what creates that that very uncomfortable dissonance that says I, I don't know what's happening. Um, and I think I think that's what really attracts magicians. I think that fascinates me. I think it fascinates Teller. I think that's what fascinates us at a young age, 
you know, I was a, a, a boy obsessed with the truth, learning about how to deceive people while I was absolutely obsessed with the truth, which is why I ended up in the skeptic movement. You know, Teller tells a wonderful story, not to speak for him about but when he, how pissed off he was when he found out his parents, were, his mother was lying to him about Santa Claus. So, you know, when, when, when it's clear, and much of conjuring is without once until we move into mentalism and all of that, then it gets sloppy. Um, but much of the best of magic to me, what fascinates me and what fascinates the audience is seeing the absolutely convincing demonstration of what we absolutely confidently know is impossible. That's what creates that sense of dissonance. And that is an art. That is what makes magic unique as an art. As, as Max Maven says, I'll quote him again in a different uh, respect. He said, all arts incorporate mystery, but no art other than magic is purely about mystery. And that is the mystery, right? To, to present people with the impossible. Amen. And it has all sorts of implications of what it's about, of what it reminds us about the world and how we relate to mysteries, right? What mysteries can we solve? What, what mysteries can't we solve? What mysteries do we want to solve? What mysteries do we not want to solve? Magic um, inherently speaks to all of that. What, what, and and what, what the, the big danger that, that mentalists are always up against is the fact that not everybody knows that what they're doing is impossible. So that, that wonderful dissonance yep. that you're talking about is yep. incomplete, right? And so instead of becoming an, the experience of the two things that are in conflict, it just becomes the one thing. It just, it, it rides right along the one thing. People know when, people know perfectly well that when the saw goes through Georgie uh, and, and police do not come, that that was a trick. <laughs> Right. That, that's that is absolute proof. The fact that when I ram the knife through Penn's hand and he doesn't go to the hospital, that's absolute proof. So they know that's impossible. There's there's a trick that we do that I, I've always I've always liked very much because of the uh, because of the way it's framed. Uh, water it, tank. Because the uh, well, well, the, well, we can go with the okay, water tank. I trying to see if I could guess. No, but in, in, in one of our tricks, we, we, we promise that I will hold my breath until Penn successfully finds a selected card. And then it turns out that he doesn't find the selected card and I drown and die. And he turns my body around in the, in the tank of water that I've been in. And the selected card is now in my diving mask. Um, 13 and, minutes till somebody and, said, uh, let him out. Yeah, yeah. And then Penn comments on that. Uh, but we, and we, and we let me stay in the tank way too long. And sometimes we use it as a first act closer. So the audience never sees me alive there. And at the top of the second act, we walk out and they know that I'm not dead. You know, a, it's a masterpiece. It's, uh, a masterpiece. Uh, well, the one I was going to mention is uh, we do it. We do a trick where uh, I, we animate a, a red ball. Uh, there's, a, 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 there's a red ball that, uh, that behaves like a trained dog. But the introduction to it is Penn comes out and says, now here's a trick that's done with a piece of thread. He is telling the dead level truth. The audience then watches this trick, which has a lot of emotional appeal because it's sort of sweet and, you know, and childlike. And then at the end, Penn walks out, picks up the ball by the thread from my hands and cuts the thread and kicks it off stage. So we've, got, we, we've done everything possible there. We've given the audience the whole range of experience because they go, first they go, oh, it's going to be done with a piece of thread. And then they sit there trying to figure out how it could be done with a piece of thread and maybe conclude that we were lying about that. And then Penn comes out and proves it at the end. So there's this very, very complex circuit of we're telling the truth, we're just not telling the details of the truth. But in no case, I think, does anyone actually believe that the ball has come to life. And so that, that essential point that you made, Jamie, of people must know what the reality of it is, or they're not, or they're not, or they're not really watching a magic performance. And your great observation, very briefly, in the introduction to Banachek's uh, first psychological, uh, uh, psychological, whatever it's called, book, uh, where you, where you say, you know, the, the 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 whole thing that makes conjuring interesting is people knowing that what's being done can't be done, and that if you now believe that you're that the performer just has these abilities, well, now you've just come to a freak show. You're just watching a person do what they were born able to do. It's not, it has none of the dissonant qualities. 
you know, yeah. I, another one of our favorite yeah. of our favorite ideas is using magic to simulate commonplace reality. You know, and there's 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 a trick there's a trick that we do in which we're not doing it much now because cigarette smoking has become unfashionable uh, and it's unhealthy. But the the trick is I come out, I light a cigarette, I put it out and I take out another cigarette and light it and, and puff on it. That's the trick. We're simulating commonplace reality. And then we show how that trick was done. And it's an intricate sleight of hand routine in which lit cigarettes are substituted for unlit cigarettes and there's swaps and switches and things. And we demonstrate a bunch of magic principles on it. But th that, that, that conflict is really simple. what magic is about. It's called look simple. Terrific. So uh, though I'm sure we could go on for at least another hour, uh, just the four of us, uh, I want to turn to some questions from the audience. And one of them, uh, which is precisely about the issue we've been discussing right now, uh, is from Pablo Grassi. He asks, what about magic tricks? And he's talking about magic tricks here, presumably not mentalism, that are experienced without viewers knowing they are observing a magic trick, for example, not in the context of a magic show. So what do you think that means for the question of the creation of the sort of dissonance that you're describing as, as, as uh, the experience of which is integral to the emotional experience that's distinctive of magic? Isn't that just crime? Yeah, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, if, if, somebody, if, somebody, if somebody does psychic surgery, that's a magic trick that people don't know are, is, is a magic trick, and it's just criminal. You know, I, I think that's it's that simple, really. Yeah, three, yeah, three card Monty. Yeah, three card Monty, exactly. All right. So um, a second question, um, and it's interesting that in a conversation about uh, magic and emotion, nobody has once mentioned the W word, um, wonder, um, <laughs> and uh, so we have a question from Suyash Joshi. <laughs> Um, and I guess this is directed probably first of all to Teller who mentioned surprise early on. Is surprise the same thing as wonder? No, uh, no. Um, I, 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 I don't think, to, to me, I, I don't think, I, this will get me in trouble, but. Yay, I, do I, it. <laughs> I don't think wonder is really part of ma the art of magic. I think wonder is what I do when I go out and I look at the stars and it sends, it sends chills up my spine. Um, I, you know, I, 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 wonder is, to me, wonder has to be true wonder. What, or, or, you know, I guess you could say, I really, really love that routine. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. That caused me wonder. But if you're, if you're trying to convey the idea that a magical effect should be the equivalent of the real wonder that we should really all be feeling at the true mysteries of the universe. Um, I, I would I would argue that that's not that's not that's not to my taste. Yeah, so I think the term wonder is wildly overused in magic, and especially when you join it with the word childlike, that, <laughs> ma that makes that makes me uh, kind of ill. <laughs> because the notion of childlike wonder, you know, you know, you know, find the child, find the child within you and slap it is sort of my point of view on this. Because um, the no notion of childlike wonder is about not knowing, and not knowing is not where real wonder comes from. So I think that real wonder, I I've had the privilege, especially because of my skeptical activism, to know a lot of great scientists. And I think great scientists who not just know a lot about the natural world, but they also know more than the rest of us about what we don't yet know. They have a finer sense of the line of what we know and what we don't know, right? Of, you know, the milliseconds after the bing bang that we still have a little stuff to figure out there. Um, and I think when you stand on that, threshold of knowing and not knowing, I think that's where real wonder exists. It's not about not knowing. It's about knowing up against not knowing. And so I do think that in magic, wonder comes in sometimes in the sense 
Um, there's a great quote from uh, the guy who wrote The Firm, which is a terrible book, um, but uh, he says, um, when a magician makes a ball disappear, the, point, the, the important thing is not whether or not the ball really disappeared, it's that isn't it wondrous that a human being can do that? Mm. And I think there's a bit of heroism in magic, inherent in magic. I think that, uh, you know, Juan Tamariz talks about myths, the inherent myths of magic in his incredible tome, The Magic Rainbow. And he says something I always thought, which was that the ambitious card, a classic plot in magic, is the wrong metaphor because for that trick. And that's not why it's appealing. Ambition in itself, blind ambition is not appealing. But that ambitious card is appealing because it's about ascension. And people actually feel that, this, this, this constant, this rising and this sort of succeeding against obstacles, if you will. And that I think there's a kind of heroism in that, in the sense that, you know, when I watch a baseball player make a great catch, I feel like there, but for the grace of a slight different, you know, generic inheritance and some environmental conditioning, go I. We're a lot more alike than we're different. Isn't it great he could do that? That means I could do that. And I think audiences identify that with magic. Isn't that incredible that my fellow human being can do that? That means in theory, I, I could do that. So I think that's where the wonder really comes in magic. I think people experience that time where they just go, you know, I've, on occasion, I've had people cry over the beauty of a magic trick. Mm -hmm. Just that it was so, to them, I'm, I, I'm not speaking for them, I'm saying what they've said to me afterwards. It's not common, but I've absolutely had, I, I had somebody spontaneously cry in front of me over a close, a bit of close-up magic, and eventually recover themselves and say, I, it was just, it's just so beautiful. It's just so, uh, you know, and Teller has a wonderful essay in the David P. Abbott book about that sometimes magic, for all this stuff that we're talking about, all these highfalutin ideas that we try and imbue magic with, sometimes a piece of art can stand just because it's a commitment to beauty. And I think that's part of where people can actually experience wonder with magic. It's not childlike. Yeah. And for psychologists, I would always wonder if it's just simply the simply, simply, not simply, but I always feel it has a it has a component of surprise with uh, curiosity. But uh, I would like Jason to say something about it. I know he's only here to make us talk, but <laughs> yeah. can't now yes. let this question go away. Yes, you've written about it. this, Jason. Yeah. yeah exactly. Well, I, I, I uh, something here. <laughs> And, and Jamie and I have had some some exchanges about this as well. Um, but I'll, I'll say simply that that um, something like what what Teller was saying, which is that um, that uh, magic tricks themselves as objects of wonder, um, that seems like a miscategorization to me. It seems that what we might have, in the same way that um, that. Uh, you know, Jamie has described um, uh, magic as a kind of burlesque of science, um, a playful engagement with the boundary between the known and the unknown. And um, I think that what we might have in the case of, of, of magic tricks with respect to, to wonder, it's not wonder proper, but something like a reenactment, a playful reenactment of the moment of wonder that you might find at the beginning of scientific or at the heart of scientific inquiry. Um, so I think that there's a way in which what we have is something like quasi wonder or pseudo wonder, a simulacrum of wonder, um, but it's not authentic wonder in the sense that authentic wonder provokes inquiry. Magic tricks don't generally, unless you go on to become a magician, provoke inquiry. Um, they, they do provoke that rhythm of thought, Jamie, that you were describing, that Whit Hayden talks about, the burr under the saddle of the mind, to which you return again and again. But you don't return to it with serious problem-solving attitudes. You don't think that here is a mystery that I have to figure out. Indeed, you cherish the fact that you can't figure it out, that you don't figure it out, and you cherish the ability to return to it again and again, and once again, rub up against that the unknown, the boundary between the known and the unknown, but in a playful way. So 
that's my that's my yeah but just because but that's the narrow mystery on the face of it of the magic trick just because the person doesn't doesn't pursue the solution to the magic trick doesn't mean they are not actually led into an inquiry a self-inquiry this awareness uh that that christine referred to of you know how easily am i fooled what does that mean to me what does that tell me about myself? What does it tell me about other people? What does it tell me about my place in the universe? I, so this idea that it doesn't lead to inquiry, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that. Well, okay, I, I, can, I can accept everything you said, and I think you can accept everything I said, namely that it doesn't lead to, 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 to inquiry in the sense in which um, when someone discovers that uh, you know, an object in the lab is glowing when now illuminated by a certain sort of light, and they ask themselves, why is that glowing? I want to figure out what's going well, on here. Because we're doing art, not science. And that, well, and that's... precisely. Right. So it's being received in a certain way. And it's not treated as an opportunity for scientific inquiry. Though it may be treated, like much art, as an opportunity for personal so, so no, So any, so wonder, there's no, wonder is only, can only be achieved through science and inquiry and not through art, all art, all <laughs> artistically induced wonder is pseudo wonder or is simulacrum of wonder. <laughs> I'm not going to generalize. I'm not going to fall prey to <laughs> your tricks. Um, but I will just say <laughs> that focusing on this, the narrow, what you were describing is this narrow, um, the, 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 this narrow experience, narrowly character, this experience narrowly characterized of our response to, say, um, the card uh, vanishing or the coin vanishing or um, the, the woman um, uh, floating through a hoop. Um, whatever it may be, our, the, 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 this narrowly characterized experience. Should we say, I, ex- we, audiences experience wonder in the face of that and compare that to, as Teller was describing, the wonder you might feel when you go outside on a cloudless, moonless night it can be and similar. look at the sky? I, 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 as I presented it before, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I think that's a similar thing, yes. Yeah, so I, I agree with the similarity. I just don't think they're the same. So I think one is a sort of a playful reenactment of the other. That's my only emendation to your to your account there but anyway enough about me let's get back to some of our audience questions um so christine this is a question for you from adrian um was the intensity of belief in your experiments uh, correlated at all um to education levels or related to faith or um if you tell us a little bit about the um about, about those features of the um of, of the uh, the subjects in your experiments so uh, these were psychology students uh, at the very beginning of their studies. And um, that was probably why we also were quite surprised because we made the experiments in London where Gustav is as well as in Lausanne where I am. Um, and we had people just thinking about going to university or being just right now at university. and. Uh, Gustav also tested some people, if I'm not mistaken, on master level. Um, and it it seemed to be all across the board. And I feel and, and men and women alike, so it it um, we didn't we didn't see any differences there. And but I I I think it is potentially also the immediate effect of it and and again the emotionality that was not at the beginning what we were interested in we were just interested just interested in um, explanations of the event we were just drawn towards the question of emotionality because we couldn't ignore it I mean if you have a, a lot of people with some people being really one almost full of wonder or awe and others being horrified and others being upset and others being happy, uh, you, you can't not take these human reactions of the audience into, into consideration. So we don't have any, um, an, any information right now to non-university samples, but I agree that this would be an interesting thing to do. However, I expect the results not to be very different. Because I, I guess I guess I guess where well, I would find it very interesting, but we only started to do it and we have one data set um, that we currently also write up with Gustav and it is um, debunking people and seeing how they respond to the event about a week later. And we also try to do it 
in a new study we are starting where we again look at people's reactions when they got debunked. So how, how do they respond um, exactly? How, how they integrate over several days what they've seen, including the debunking, because what I know more from skeptic events as well that I have attended and presented the, the, the work on paranormal belief, if you have a, a believer in the audience and you kind of make the argument that belief in, 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 in paranormal phenomena is due to cognitive biases and personality or all other such things of human existence, then you often get somebody saying in the back, yeah, well, okay, fine, you tell me that, but what's about the true medium? What's about the true ghost? What's about the true? So there seems this dissonance about, uh, also to talk about dissonance again, using the word too, is on the one hand, you can uh, adopt the information that right now what you've seen is fake and not true and might have these links, but there's still this other world outside that um, where this phenomena exist. So it's very difficult to use such arguments to open people's mind to alternative explanations. And I guess that again, coming back to fake news, that's also why once people arrived at a conclusion, it is really, really tough to change it. So I guess, yeah, as, as, as uh, Jamie and also Taylor meant, and I think there were also kind of a couple of uh, conversations going on. I, I guess that's the right thing to let people not go out of the performance of, of knowing and reinforcing again, you know, that it's been an illusion. But I, I, I even think not right now that it will generalize to other phenomena that you can find on the internet or that you can be told via books or other sources. And I think it's a general phenomena. Humans are inclined to believe and um, to make explanations that reduce dissonance. And if it's an uh, explanation that psychic phenomena are true, um, then they might adapt to these beliefs because it, re it can reduce this dissonance, this but, but Christina, you, 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 do the, you do the really good smart framing device, which is you do that whole show and then you tell people how it worked. Is that, and, and, and that's that, what we do now, yeah. yeah, yeah and, by, and, and by doing that, you have given them the information that they need to make a rational decision. Yeah. They, 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 they can go away and they can say, oh, they can go away and say, oh, well, that wasn't real, but I believe it outside of that. But you haven't contributed to the misinformation by, by that. And, and you've, also, you've also celebrated the art of it. You know, you've, you've given them an extra, an extra bit of pleasure yeah. by, you know, by, by saying, look, look how we can do this. Isn't this fun? Yeah. And yeah. that's kind of very seductive, too. Yeah, so what we, what, and, and definitely, and what we try to do, I try to understand who what are the contributors for people to be upset or amused or surprised or um, yeah, wanting to know more about it? Because we have in, in the debriefing after it, when we discuss and explain, we still have these different reactions. So not everybody will um, integrate it in the, in the way that you would hope so. So I try to tap now onto that question, what distinguishes these different people. And if I ask them again a week later, how do they talk about it? What have they actually integrated? Could, could, were they able to integrate that? Uh, yes, the reality, as much as it seems to be real, can be false. And what do they do with it? Because mm -hmm. basically, they have to admit that you can cheat on them. You know, that's a question about lying again. And I guess some people find it difficult to integrate. Um, and probably get stubborn about it or angry about it. And so in a couple of years, I guess I have more answers to that one because I'm quite interested in that right now. The more you're studying and focusing on mechanisms of belief, though, the further away, I mean, magic seems almost incidental to me, to that, to that subject matter. You know, as a skeptic, <laughs> as a longtime skeptic, you know, people have the illusion that they choose what they believe in based on evidence, but of course that's not true at all. People, people believe, end up believing invariably based on worldview. 
And then they accept what fits with their worldview and they reject what doesn't fit with their worldview and they select and reject evidence accordingly to justify that. And that's why, you know, the, the, the best solution. And in fact, I think we ended on this in the last panel I took part in now that I think about it with, with uh, Soma is that, you know, the best hope for the future is not talking people out of uh, irrational thinking, but rather raising, a, you know, children to be good critical thinkers. Because, um, yeah. yeah, it's hard to change people's minds. It's not impossible, but it's, yeah. it's hard. And what that calls to mind for me also is I've, I've always been just absolutely astounded at the, at the famous mediums in history who get caught absolutely absolutely caught and they say yes i had to do a trick tonight so i wouldn't disappoint you because the spiritual forces weren't uh weren't, weren't with me tonight and for some reason there were there are people who say oh that's plausible <laughs> yeah, just because they cheat some of the time doesn't mean they cheat all of the time which of course is the exact opposite of the reasoning of a fundamental critical thinking which is occam's razor um, but yet, you know, Randy wrote about this in the, in the original Geller book. We, he said, in the original Geller book, Randy said, when they win, they win, and when they lose, they win. Mm. <laughs> well, guys, this has been terrific. Um, we're uh, already 20 minutes over time, and I'm, again, I'm sure we could, we could go on I'm much outraged. longer, but, but, but some of us may have other plans. Jamie has about a thousand trick or treaters that are going to be knocking down his door in a few minutes. So, um, and, I, and I'm not kidding. Um, so, please, everyone, join me in thanking our guests for a remarkable hour and 20 minutes of conversation. Um, and thank you to everybody in the audience for joining us. This has been really great. Uh, thank you, guys. Mm -hmm.